Um, I'm from the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, but if you can't tell already, this has nothing to do with my work there. Um, this was, when I saw the session, I thought that sounds really interesting and I couldn't wait to get involved. So, um, but this also comes with a disclaimer because loads of people have come up to me and said, oh, I hear you're talking about Banksy. And I was like, mm, that might have been more of a metaphor. <laughs> I'm not actually talking about Banksy today. I'm really just trying to highlight the fact that when we think about graffiti artists, we tend to think of them as being men. And what I wanted to do was just bring up some contemporary female graffiti artists and give some of their own quotes about what it's like being a female graffiti artist in a fairly male-dominated um, art form. So, uh, with that in mind, this is really where my interest in graffiti started. Um, this is a selection of subway graffitis from the 70s in New York City. Um, it's sort of hard to explain to anyone who's been to New York in recent years just what New York of the 70s and 80s was like. I was, I barely was alive then. <laughs> but um, in film and in popular culture, the representation of New York was absolutely based around graffiti. Um, and it was the predominant image of New York at the time. Uh, the subway cars were absolutely covered. The city was constantly trying to fight that. They started a campaign called Clean Trains. It took 20 years to get rid of the graffiti. Um, but in this huge collage of all these different subway trains, you can see one in the upper left corner, which says pink. And this is from a woman named Lady Pink, um, or that's her moniker at least. She's often referred to as the godmother of graffiti because she was one of the very first uh, very famous female graffiti artists in the US. Um, she was born in Ecuador. She was raised in New York City. She started working in 1979. And she was the only female member of two prominent graffiti crews, the Cool Five and the Public Animals. I love those names. <laughs> Um, and so when she was asked about what it was like being a woman working in a very male environment, she says, the more guys said, you can't do that, the more I had to prove them wrong. I had to hold it up for all my sisters who looked up to me to be brave and courageous and to prove that I could do what guys could do. We defend our artwork with our fists and our crazy courage. When you have guys that disrespect you, you're going to have to teach them a lesson. Otherwise, they're going to keep walking all over you. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is out here. It's not easy. But it also reflects what the art world in general is, 80% white males. So you have to fight tooth and nail, bitch and scream, be loud and be large to get respect. So that she really kicked off a, a, a fairly big movement. And she's still working. Um, she's still very active. She's uh, now she's in museums, you know, very different contexts. <laughs> um, but she still holds, holds an annual summit exhibition and large-scale mural production um, called Bee Girl Bee. And she invites local, national, and international women to present and create artwork that is inspired and rooted in hip-hop culture. So I want to go now back again to the late 70s and early 80s. <laughs> um, this particular example is from 1979. And I really, I could have done an entire presentation just on culture jamming, which is, um, this is one of an early, relatively early form of culture jamming, uh, of modern culture jamming at least. Um, and this really sprung out of the second wave feminist movement, sort of criticizing the male gaze and also drawing attention to the fact that public spaces were dominated by these adverts that were very much, you know, demeaning to women. Uh, they were about women's bodies, but women weren't able to react to them and except in this way. So um, this is another Another example I like, I don't know if you can, that one might be a little blurrier. So it says, where, where would fashion be without pins? Free of little pricks, stop needling us. <laughs> um, and again, I think this is a tradition that continues today. Um, in France, in Paris mostly, there's a woman named Princess Hijab, um, that's her moniker. And she's another anonymous artist. Her, her identity has never been revealed. 
Um, but she uses black marker, which is a, a traditional method in, in France, um, to transform advertising into something that confronts us um, and asks us why the adverts are there in the first place and what they represent. So she started working in Paris in 2006 before the, the burqa ban, which I'm sure we all know of. Um, but since then, obviously, her, her artwork has become even more confrontational and, and more politically loaded. Um, she used to go and put up, she used to go and do her interventions, and then she would stay and watch reactions. Um, she would record them. Now she only does about four or five a year, and she usually puts them up in the middle of the night and leaves straight away because I think the threat of uh, recrimination is possibly just too high. Um, but she says, again, in her own voice, I use veiled women as a challenge, she says. Um, she's also quick to, to add that she doesn't believe that any one way of dressing is good or bad. She's not actually advocating <laughs> hijab use. Um, She's not defending the rights of any group, and she says no one needs her as a spokesperson. She says that's paternalistic. If veiled women want to make a point, they do it themselves. If feminists want to do something they're capable of, they're capable of doing it on their own. So although her work is heavily politicized, she actually distances herself from, the, from those politics. It's, it's a really interesting dynamic because many artists are much more in their face about their political motives, where I think she's, she's almost taking a step back from that. She's taking a step back from the interpretations that other people have put on her work. So again, moving into very contemporary stuff, um, going, well, this is Lady Pink's quote. So she points out that today street artists are working outside of spray paint with knitting, wood, rubber bands, pencils and stickers, and bucket paint. For so long, we've been given these urban landscapes that are dull and boring and utilitarian and gray. And then the street artists come along and we add some life and color and some urban love to our surroundings. So this was my introduction to yarn bombing, which I, some of you I think will know. Certainly the ones who live in Edinburgh will have seen, <laughs> <laughs> will have seen the tram protests, I think, that were done in yarn. Um, and I think this is another, it's a very ephemeral, well, it's actually not that ephemeral. It's more ephemeral perhaps than some forms of graffiti. But most yarn bombers tend to use acrylic knits, which don't degrade very quickly. And the colors stay vibrant for a long time. However, if um, a city council, for example, wants to remove them, they can just be cut off of whatever object they're attached to. So it's an interesting mix of... Um, trying to maintain the color involved, but also knowing that at any time they could be removed. Um, and this movement was, is often attributed to Magda Sayeg, um, who started a group called NIDA in Texas in 2006. So she was managing a clothes shop, and she was struck by the ugliness, ugliness of her steel and concrete surroundings in Houston. She was overwhelmed by what she calls a selfish desire to add color to my world. So she knitted her shop a door handle. Um, then she knitted a sheath for the stop sign pole across the road. People got out of their cars and took photos in front of it, she says. Um, she was seduced by these positive reactions. So she began splattering bits of knit across the world, over parking meters in Brooklyn, over a bus in Mexico, and most recently over the gun carried by an eight meter high statue of a soldier in Bali. She says, in this world of technology, overdevelopment, fewer trees and more concrete, it is empowering to be able to beautify your environment. It's a quiet political message, but it is a potent one. Um, and knitters around the world have taken this up. It's spread hugely in the last nine years. Um, and it ranges from the playful and the comic, things like woolly hats and mustaches placed on statues, um, <laughs> to the very political, which we'll see here. Um, and this is Marianne Jorgensen in Copenhagen. Um, and this piece was done in protest to the Iraq war. And what I think is especially amazing about this um, is that although, although the coordinating artist is based in Copenhagen, 
Um, each of these individual squares that you can see were knitted by people in countries all over Europe and America who were protesting the Iraq war. And they sent them to her. They made a film, they made a documentary film um, putting this all together, which is still on display um, at <laughs> Copenhagen Contemporary Art Center. Um, so each of these uh, each of these squares are 15 by 15 centimeters, or about six inches square. So, and I think there were just over 2,000 squares that were sent in, um, and they've managed to incorporate all of them. You can't necessarily see them all in this photo, but some of them, they've ha they had so many, they've had to tuck them in, like, under the bottom, <laughs> like, in between the wheels. Uh, they got a, a much bigger response than, than she had ever expected. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful message of, you know, a, it's it's a um, it's a very immediate response to something, and it, yeah, I just I really love this image. <laughs> um, but we also get yarn bombing that looks very similar to traditional graffiti. So um, this is. Uh, this is actually not from the group London-based Knit the City. Um, I couldn't find who made this particular example, but I thought it went well with a, a quote from a woman whose moniker is Deadly Knit Shade, um, and she's with a London-based group called Knit the City. Um, and she says, graffiti knitting or yarn storming, um, I should say most of the time in the UK they prefer yarn storming to yarn bombing. Um, which I think is quite nice as well. Um, or guerrilla knitting is the art of using items handmade from yarn to create street art. The artist creates an item using knitting or crochet. They take the item into a public space. They install the piece in that pub public place and then they run away giggling. It's really as simple as that. <laughs> and then um, the interviewer asked her, well, what's the point? And she says, that's a bit like asking how long a piece of string is. There are loads of reasons why people make woolly art. Each yarn stormer has their own reason, so I guess you'll have to ask them. <laughs> um, and a slight twist on the ephemeral art, uh, ephemeral street art. This is an artist named Mademoiselle Maurice, who's also working in France. Um, and this is mostly origami. You can see it's, it's mostly folded paper. I don't know if you can actually tell that from the from the photo. Um, they're extremely elaborate, very beautiful um, bits of street art. And the features on the face are actually yarn. They're knitted. So Mademoiselle Maurice uses a variety of materials to achieve this kind of ephemeral street art. And most of her work before 2010 um, has disappeared be just because it's paper. It's it's essentially dissolved. <laughs> um, but now, of course, she's showing in in galleries, and so I think now there's it's much more permanent. Um, but previously, the the entire point of it was the, the degradation. And unfortunately, there's no. F I haven't been able to find any photos of. You know, I can imagine what this melting origami might look like. Um, but I, I don't know why she's chosen not to capture that, because um, I think that would be amazing. But she also, she has a very similar reasoning behind her artwork um, as the founder of Nida that we talked about just a minute ago does. She says, it offers a way of ex escape, colorful and abstract thoughts into a reality both repulsive and attractive. <laughs> so she's trying to mitigate the, the, and brighten up the gray city streets. So, I think on Thursday I actually went a little bit over, and this time I'm probably going to end a little earlier. <laughs> I've gone too far the other way. But um, I wanted to highlight this quote from Tiffany Evans, who's the founder of the LA Graffiti Girls website, which is a blogumentary about female graffiti artists in LA. She says, in my honest opinion, women have rarely, rarely gotten equal shine or recognition for achievements in almost every aspect of culture. Graffiti being one of them. Unless it's pink or covered with hearts, almost everyone assumes that bomb, piece, or tag was done by a guy. It's like a default setting society puts in our heads. It's up to us to see the world through an unbiased lens and question what we see. So that's really the takeaway that I wanted you all to have from this, is really just to, when, you, when you're looking at graffiti, 
um, not to have a preconceived notion of who's created it, either in the modern world or the ancient one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>